Hello and welcome. Tonight we're reading a portion of The Yellow Wallpaper by Charlotte Perkins Gilman. So if you haven't heard of The Yellow Wallpaper, it is quite a famous short story. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the author first. So Charlotte Gilman was born in 1860 in Hartford, Connecticut. She was an American feminist, lecturer, writer, and publisher who was a leading theorist of the women's movement in the United States. She grew up in poverty with her father having basically abandoned the family and her education was irregular and limited, but she did attend the Rhode Island School of Design for a time. In May, 1884, she married Charles W. Stetson, who was an artist, but she proved to be totally unsuited to the domestic routine of marriage. And after a year or so, she was suffering from melancholia, and that eventually turned into a complete nervous collapse. She divorced her husband in 1894. Perkins began writing poems and stories for various periodicals. The Yellow Wallpaper, published in the New England Magazine in January 1892, was exceptional. Um, we'll get a little bit more why it was exceptional, but it is one of the works that is most associated with Gilman. In 1893, she published In This Our World, a volume of verse. For a time in 1894, after her move to San Francisco, California, she edited with Helen Campbell, The Impress, an organ of the Pacific Coast Women's Press Association. She also became a noted lecturer during the early 1890s on topics such as labor, ethics, and the place of women. She completed lecture tours, was a delegate to the International Socialist and Labor Congress in London, and she published in 1898, Women and Economics, a manifesto that attracted great attention and was translated into seven languages. It was a radical call for economic independence for women. She expanded on more of these ideas in concerning children and the home to other works. In June 1900, she married a cousin, George H. Gilman, with whom she lived in New York City until 1922. She joined Jane Addams in founding the Women's Peace Party in 1915, but she was little involved in other organized movements of the day. Gilman was unfortunately diagnosed with cancer and after her treatments proved ineffective, she took her own life in 1935. So that's a little bit about the author. So about this story, um, the reason why it's exceptional, it was a very realistic, very stark first person portrayal of a mental breakdown, of a physically loved but emotionally starved young wife who it seems had just had a baby, and she was brought to the countryside to recover by her husband, who was a physician. Unfortunately, she does not get better. So with all that out of the way, let's get into the story, shall we? The Yellow Wallpaper by Charlotte Perkins Gilman It is very seldom that mere ordinary people like John and myself secure ancestral halls for the summer. A colonial mansion, a hereditary estate, I would say a haunted house, and reached the height of romantic felicity, but that would be asking too much of fate. Still, I will proudly declare that there is something queer about it. Else, why should it be let so cheaply? And why have stood so long untenanted? John laughs at me, of course, but one expects that in marriage. John is practical in the extreme. He has no patience with faith, an intense horror of superstition, and he scoffs openly at any talk of things not to be felt and seen and put down in figures. John is a physician, and perhaps, I would not say it to a living soul, of course, but this is dead paper and a great relief to my mind, perhaps that is one reason I do not get well faster. You see, he does not believe I am sick, and what can one do? If a physician of high standing and one's own husband assures friends and relatives that there is really nothing the matter with one but temporary nervous depression, a slight hysterical tendency, what is one to do? 
My brother is also a physician and also of high standing, and he says the same thing. So I take phosphates or phosphites, whichever it is, and tonics and journeys and air and exercise, and am absolutely forbidden to work until I am well again. Personally, I disagree with their ideas. Personally, I believe that congenial work with excitement and change would do me good. But what is one to do? I did write for a while in spite of them, but it does exhaust me a good deal, having to be so sly about it, or else meet with heavy opposition. I sometimes fancy that in my condition, if I had less opposition and more society and stimulus? But John says the very worst thing I can do is to think about my condition, and I confess it always makes me feel bad. So I will let it alone and talk about the house. The most beautiful place. It is quite alone, standing well back from the road, quite three miles from the village. It makes me think of English places that you read about, for there are hedges and walls and gates that lock, and lots of separate little houses for the gardeners and people. There is a delicious garden. I never saw such a garden, large and shady, full of box-bordered paths, and lined with long, grape-covered arbors with seats under them. There were greenhouses, too, but they are all broken now. There was some legal trouble, I believe, something about the heirs and co-heirs. Anyhow, the place has been empty for years. That spoils my ghostliness, I am afraid, but I don't care. There's something strange about the house. I can feel it. I even said so to John one moonlit evening, but he said what I felt was a draft, and shut the window. I get unreasonably angry with John sometimes. I'm sure I never used to be so sensitive. I think it is due to this nervous condition. But John says if I feel so, I shall neglect proper self-control, so I take pains to control myself, before him at least, and that makes me very tired. I don't like our room a bit. I wanted one downstairs that opened on the piazza and had roses all over the window and such pretty old-fashioned chintz hangings, but John would not hear of it. He said there was only one window and not room for two beds and no near room for him if he took another. He is very careful and loving and hardly lets me stir without special direction. I have a scheduled prescription for each hour in the day. He takes all care from me so I feel basely ungrateful not to value it more. He said we came here solely on my account, that I was to have perfect rest and all the air I could get. Your exercise depends on your strength, my dear, said he, and your food somewhat on your appetite, but air you can absorb all the time. So we took the nursery at the top of the house. It is a big airy room, the whole floor nearly, with windows that look all ways in air and sunshine galore. It was nursery first, and then playroom and gymnasium, I should judge. For the windows are barred for little children, and there are rings and things in the walls. The paint and paper look as if a boys' school had used it. It is stripped off, the paper, in great patches all around the head of my bed, about as far as I can reach. And in a great place on the other side of the room, low down, I never saw a worse paper in my life. One of those sprawling, flamboyant patterns committing every artistic sin. It is dull enough to confuse the eye in following, pronounced enough to constantly irritate and provoke study, and when you follow the lame, uncertain curves for a little distance, they suddenly commit suicide, plunge off at outrageous angles, destroy themselves in unheard of contradictions. The color is repellent, almost revolting, a smoldering, unclean yellow, strangely faded by the slow-turning sunlight. It is a dull yet lurid orange in some places, a sickly sulfur tint in others. No wonder the children hated it. I should hate it myself if I had to live in this room long. There comes John, and I must put this away. He hates to have me write a word. We have been here two weeks, and I haven't felt like writing before since that first day. I am sitting by the window now, up in this atrocious nursery, and there is nothing to hinder my writing as much as I please, save lack of strength. John is away all day, and even some nights when his cases are serious. I am glad my case is not serious. But these nervous troubles are dreadfully depressing. 
John does not know how much I really suffer. He knows there is no reason to suffer, and that satisfies him. Of course, it is only nervousness. It does weigh on me so not to do my duty in any way. I meant to be such a help to John, such a real rest and comfort. And here I am, a comparative burden already. Nobody would believe what an effort it is to do what little I am able, to dress and entertain and order things. It is fortunate Mary is so good with the baby. Such a dear baby. And yet I cannot be with him. It makes me so nervous. I suppose John never was nervous in his life. He laughs at me so about this wallpaper. At first, he meant to repaper the room, but afterwards he said that I was letting it get the better of me and that nothing was worse for a nervous patient than to give way to such fancies. He said that after the wallpaper was changed, it would be the heavy bedstead, and then the barred windows, and then that gate at the head of the stairs, and so on. You know the place is doing you good, he said. And really, dear, I don't care to renovate the house just for a three months rental. Then do let us go downstairs, I said. There are such pretty rooms there. Then he took me in his arms and called me a blessed little goose, and said he would go down to the cellar if I wished and have it whitewashed into the bargain but he is right enough about the beds and windows and things. It is an airy and comfortable room, as anyone need wish, and of course I would not be so silly as to make him uncomfortable just for a whim. I'm really getting quite fond of the big room, all but that horrid paper. Out of one window I can see the garden, those mysterious deep-shaded arbors, the riotous old-fashioned flowers, and bushes and gnarly trees. Out of another I get a lovely view of the bay, and a little private wharf belonging to the estate. There is a beautiful shaded lane that runs down there from the house. I always fancy I see people walking in these numerous paths and arbors, but John has cautioned me not to give way to fancy in the least. He says that with my imaginative power and a habit of story-making, a nervous weakness like mine is sure to lead to all manner of excited fancies, and that I ought to use my will and good sense to check the tendency. So I try. I think sometimes that if I were only well enough to write a little, it would relieve the press of ideas and rest me. But I find I get pretty tired when I try. It is so discouraging not to have any advice and companionship about my work. When I get really well, John says we will ask Cousin Henry and Julia down for a long visit. But he says he would as soon put fireworks in my pillowcase as to let me have those stimulating people about now. I wish I could get well faster. But I must not think about that. This paper looks to me as if it knew what a vicious influence it had. There is a recurrent spot where the pattern lulls like a broken neck and two bulbous eyes stare at you upside down. I get positively angry with the impertinence of it and the everlastingness. Up and down and sideways they crawl, and those absurd, unblinking eyes are everywhere. There is one place where two breaths don't match, and the eyes go all up and down the line, one a little higher than the other. I never saw so much expression in an inanimate thing before, and we all know how much expression they have. I used to lie awake as a child and get more entertainment and terror out of blank walls and plain furniture than most children could find in a toy store. I remember what a kindly wink the knobs of our big old bureau used to have, and there was one chair that always seemed like a strong friend. I used to feel that if any of the other things looked too fierce, I could always hop into that chair and be safe. The furniture in this room is no worse than inharmonious, however, for we had to bring it all from downstairs. I suppose when this was used as a playroom, they had to take the nursery things out, and no wonder... I never saw such ravages as the children have made here. The wallpaper, as I said before, is torn off in spots, and it sticketh closer than a brother. They must have had perseverance as well as hatred. Then the floor is scratched and gouged and splintered. The plaster itself is dug out here and there, and this great heavy bed, which is all we found in the room, looks as if it had been there through the wars. But I don't mind it a bit. Only the paper... There comes John's sister, such a dear girl as she is, and so careful of me. I must not let her find me writing. 
She is a perfect and enthusiastic housekeeper and hopes for no better profession. I verily believe she thinks it is the writing in which made me sick, but I can write when she is out and see her a long way off from these windows. There is one that commands the road, a lovely shaded winding road, and one that looks off over the country. A lovely country, too, full of great elms and velvet meadows. This wallpaper has a kind of sub-pattern in a different shade, a particularly irritating one, for you can only see it in certain lights, and not clearly then. But in the places where it isn't faded and where the sun is just so, I can see a strange, provoking, formless sort of figure that seems to skulk about behind that silly and conspicuous front design. Their sister on the stairs. Well, the 4th of July is over. The people are gone and I am tired out. John thought it might do me good to see a little company. So we just had Mother and Nellie and the children down for a week. Of course, I didn't do a thing. Jenny sees to everything now. But it tired me all the same. John says if I don't pick up faster, he shall send me to Weir Mitchell in the fall. But I don't want to go there at all. I had a friend who was in his hands once. And she says he is just like John and my brother, only more so. Besides, it is such an undertaking to go so far. I don't feel as if it was worth while to turn my hand over for nothing, and I'm getting dreadfully fretful and querulous. I cry at nothing and cry most of the time. Of course, I don't when John is here, or anybody else, but when I am alone. And I am alone a good deal just now. John is kept in town very often by serious cases, and Jenny is good and lets me alone when I want her to. So I walk a little while in the garden or down that lovely lane, sit on the porch under the roses, and lie down up here a good deal. I'm getting really fond of the room in spite of the wallpaper. Perhaps because of the wallpaper. It dwells in my mind so. I lie here on this great immovable bed. It is nailed down, I believe and follow that pattern about by the hour. It is as good as gymnastics, I assure you. I'll start, we'll say, at the bottom, down in the corner over there, where it has not been touched. And I determine for the thousandth time that I will follow that pointless pattern to some sort of conclusion. I know a little of the principle of design, and I know this thing was not arranged on any law of radiation or alternation or repetition or symmetry or anything else that I ever heard of. It is repeated, of course, by the breaths, but not otherwise. Looked at in one way, each breath stands alone, the bloated curves and flourishes, a kind of debased Romanesque with delirium tremens, go waddling up and down in isolated columns of fatuity. But on the other hand, they connect diagonally, and the sprawling outlines run off in great slanting waves of optic horror, like a lot of wallowing seaweeds in full chase. The whole thing goes horizontally, too, at least it seems so, and I exhaust myself in trying to distinguish the order of its going in that direction. They have used a horizontal breadth for a frieze, and that adds wonderfully to the confusion. There is one end of the room where it is almost intact, and there when the cross lights fade and the low sun shines directly upon it. I could almost fancy radiation after all. The interminable grotesque seem to form around a common center and rush off in headlong plunges of equal distraction. It makes me tired to follow it. I will take a nap, I guess. So you can see a little bit of her obsession with the wallpaper already. Um, she's quite interested in figuring out the pattern behind it from beginning to end. And she is very, very cautious with her writing. And she doesn't seem to trust her husband very much either, in some cases. She seems to love him, definitely. But trust might be another matter. So I hope you enjoyed, and we'll read another portion um, later in this month. So I hope you join us again.